Welcome back to EV Obsession. It's been about four days since we've done one of these. Zachary's all hopped up on caffeine. I've been drinking since yesterday. Welcome. Drinking coffee or something else? <laughs> yes. Okay. So lead us off, Zachary. What is right. our first we have a story lot of, today? Yeah, we have a lot of stories. It's crazy. Joe is flying blind. He doesn't even know what's coming for him. He's like, nah, let's just go. I don't need to see the links. We're going to wing it. We're going to wing see it. how this goes. I got to remember, you know, it does different things visually. If I start one thing first and the other second, the immersive view versus the screen share. I'm not really sure which one works better, but we're going to start with immersive view. Hi, here we are. That's right. It doesn't actually show anything on their side until we switch over to the uh, screen sharing. Yeah, we'll see. Fantastic. How- All right. So I had the option. Start with some really exciting news. We have a lot of really cool, exciting news to cover. Or start with something that's just really frustrating. And I just couldn't do it. I had to start with the frustrating bit. (laughs) That's good. I think, you know, in our next life, we'll come back as someone who is, uh, you know, more zen or more at peace. But that's only because we'll get it out of our system this time around. Um, You know, this is, I I saw this story and I thought it was really good, but I think just in general, it's worth talking about the fact that over and over and over again, new EV buyers are just completely blown away by the complexity of EV charging. And even people who are, you know, you and I were having a discussion in the chat earlier this morning, even people who are from the EV space and have been in and around EVs for a number of years, it's still hard to figure out how to explain to people, you know, what to do, where to go, how to get juice in the car. So uh, yeah, if you want to read this one out, I think this is a great, yeah, I think this guy makes a lot of solid points. I think he's also probably a nutter, but that's a different (laughs) comment. No, yeah, no, I I put this one first because it's stimulated a lot of conversation quickly. Um, It's just one of those stories everybody got into and had an opinion to share. We've been talking about it on our writer chat. And so immediately it, it already had like, okay, we should talk about this as well. But also we were talking about something separate, a separate incident, which we'll loop in later in this conversation. I think I'm on, on the same story uh, that is a similar, you know, is related. So basically a case of, you know, people getting electric car rentals and not getting anything to support them on their electric trip so but yeah let's start with this one so this is an interesting one i don't think i've ever seen this before but uh we're not going to read this whole note because it's sort of long but basically there seems like there's a set of like three um ev go fast chargers somewhere and there are different uh power capacities so regina is the name of one of them has a 350 kilowatt capacity and then ernie and florence have a 100 kilowatt capacity and I guess there's an issue with some cars that can't charge beyond 100 kilowatts parking and plugging into the 350 kilowatt Regina stall. That's right. And, and, you know, obviously then blocking that faster charging stall from, uh, from uh, you know, cars that could actually use it. So the note is like basically like, if your car is one of these, do not park on the Regina stall. Park at Ernie or Florence, you know, and it's, you know, like, there's a lot of bold and underline. <laughs> yeah. Text no, yelling. I mean, this guy is definitely a mental patient. So let's get that out of the way. Whoever no, posted I, this sign is a very frustrated, very unstable type of person who like went to a lot of effort to like really get cranky here. I would disagree for one clear reason. The, wrote the it. grammar and the punctuation <laughs> is really good. Oh, there, there's plenty of crazy okay, people fine. that are English professors. What are you charging me with? <laughs> are you telling me I'm crazy? I'm I'm certain that you just know because this. I'm very obsessive about the Oxford comma. I as you, as you should be. No, but you know this is one of those things, and I I, I say this all the time. You know, I did a, a, a podcast with Matt Teske every week for three years, and he's the founder and creator of an app called Chargeway which is not really well known, but which I think addresses almost all of these problems. One of the things that it does when you pick your vehicle 
is it only shows you vehicles that you can, or charging stations that you can use with your vehicle. And I've tried to explain this to people. It's kind of like gasoline and diesel. Like, you know, people still understand, oh yeah, diesel is different. You got to find a station with diesel. So this is the pump that you go up to. On Chargeways app, they do a really nice job of explaining that not all vehicles can accept all charging speeds. And the way they do this is instead of doing level one and level two, and then DC fast charging, they split up that DC fast charging into level three, four, five, six, and seven. And if you have a car that can only charge up to say level four, which is like a Chevy Bolt, or level five, which is like an Audi e-tron, one of the early e-trons, it's only going to send you to those chargers. So you would never get sent to Regina. And I think the problem with plug share and the problem with even better route planner and a lot of these is that they allow you to say, I only want to go to like the ultimate maximum fast charger. And people who don't understand that their vehicle cannot accept that charging speed will always go to the highest number because they think they're going to get the best charging experience that way. And I, this goes back to this whole idea of we are giving EV drivers way too much credit to understand everything that they're doing and everything that they're looking for in order to deliver them the best charging experience. The best charging experience might not always be at the highest capacity charger. The best charging experience is the one that is most seamlessly integrated into your life. You know, like if you're like an AMC theater operator and you want to put charge points out there, don't put ultra high speed chargers that are going to top off the car in 20 minutes because then somebody's going to have to go in, get a movie ticket, get their popcorn, and then move their car out of the way halfway through the movie or a third of the way through the movie. You want a nice, you know, 50 kilowatts, so it's still DC, but they're going to be there for two and a half to three hours get them in and out and you're golden. And this kind of speaks to that. Like, I, you know, I say that this person is a little bit crazy. That's unfair, but they might very well be an engineer or at least someone who's highly educated in EVs and who is frustrated by the lack of understanding of the general public. And that is only going to come from better, more clear communication in the same way that People don't necessarily understand octane in their vehicle. I know people who are gearheads who love cars who have no idea what octane means, but they understand regular and premium. This is the kind of language that we need with EVs and we need around EV charging. And until we kind of all agree to use a simpler way to talk about EVs, we're never going to get mass adoption. And stuff like this is, is exactly why. Whoever sees this, if this is your first experience with an EV and you run across this guy, you're not going to go, oh, wow, what a thoughtful EV driver who made this easy for me. You're going to go, these people are psychos. Yeah, you get a regular EV. You have That's a it. premium. Now, That's it. There's a, there's a lot there no, to unpack. First of all, I think, I think there's just some basic info that, you know, there's so much marketed about different electric cars and charging networks. And yeah, we just sort of seem to skip over to basics sometimes and that's i think right. some and that, that goes for tesla as well as all the others um i think there sh should be like a a clear even standardized process uh that's makes it really obvious to someone in the ev what their max charging rate is because as this guy is saying and as we're saying most people don't know what their cars i mean really the vast majority of ev drivers probably don't know what their max charging rate is that should be something that's understandable and clear that should also be clear and understandable on all charging stations uh, and uh that would that would help a lot with regards to charge way i uh i have a lot to, to say on it so first of all i haven't used it before because i've had a tesla for the past four plus years and have no need for it and before that, I either wasn't aware of it or I didn't think about it. And I used, I did use plug share. It worked well for me. Charge point. Um, that was all I really needed. Uh, I had some others I didn't really use. So I, you said in the chat, if Matt, if, if the founder, Matt Teske, wasn't my friend, I'd evangelize this so much better, so, so hard. I was like, Joe, I was going to say, but I was just going to say it on air. Joe, just do it. If you think this is a great product, evangelize it like heck, you know, like evangelize I, I it do. everywhere. I really like think push it. 
so I have questions on it. So, so, cause okay. I'll give the story briefly of what happened to me the other day. I was at a Tesla supercharger. I was about to leave. This guy walks up to me across the parking lot. Uh, he's got a Hyundai Ioniq five parked at a Tesla supercharger. And he's like, Hey, uh, can these not charge here? And I was like, Oh Lordy, this is, <laughs> this is, he was a nice guy, professional guy staying at a very fancy hotel. I found out later, but seemed like a down to earth, nice guy. Um, but just basically had somehow no clue where to charge and how to charge an Ionique 5 that he had rented. Now, it comes up, he had requested a Tesla, and they gave him a Hyundai Ionique 5 instead. So it's not like he was really prepared ahead of time because he got to the counter and they gave him a different EV. Right. I think, first of all, rental car companies should be asking first of all do you have an ev of your own if you're renting an ev and you have an ev that's fine that's easy you can you can figure it out if you don't have an ev and you're trying to rent a tesla to check it out or another ev and you get given an ev you have to be told a few clear things this is how you charge this is where you charge here are your cards and accounts for charging it seems like they don't give those. So, so first of all, yeah. they need to they need to give these accounts because you can't expect someone renting a car to get an app, set up an account. Sometimes you have to be mailed a card, or you have to get on support. What if you can't see the number because this charging station uh, thing is so beat up? That's a real story. You know? So I had to walk through this with this guy. Okay, how much charge do you have? He's like, well, I I don't know, I have like 150 miles. I'm like, okay, so wh where are you going? Where where are you trying to go right now? Like. Like trying to figure out, should he charge in front of the Whole Foods that has charge point stations there? Or does he have some near him that I know? And it ended up, you know, he's down near downtown. I'm like, okay, you've got some down there. Uh, you can plug in there, walk around downtown, see downtown. And, you know, knowing the context, you can sp spend a few hours there. You don't want to spend a few hours at Whole Foods. <laughs> or <laughs> no. drive half an hour up north and get an Electrify America station where you, you obviously don't have an account. And I don't know, I haven't used them much, so I don't remember what the process was for getting that set up. But it's just a disaster. And the, the lack of awareness, the lack of awareness combined with the lack of basic education that either car companies or rental car companies are providing is is creating a bit of a disaster. I mean, as everyone on our team, I think, agreed, this is going to turn a lot of people off to electric vehicles. Sure. And I think the number one thing that if I was an oil company, and I certainly am not suggesting that this is what's happening. This is not a conspiracy. I don't mean to sell it as a conspiracy. I'm just saying if I was an oil company <laughs> and I wanted to create bad blood and negative feelings and animosity towards EVs, I would do exactly what Hertz is doing. I would give people EVs yeah. with no training and no direction and tell them, go off into the wilderness with ye and handle it. And it highlights two things. Number one, the OEMs, with the exception of Tesla, and I'll put that caveat in there, the OEMs have done an absolutely horrible, terrible, inexcusable job of explaining to people how to charge their cars and working the charging solution into their software. Mercedes has a charge station finder in their app and it's horrible. Volkswagen has the EA network and it's spotty at best. So I, I have a real problem with that. And I think it definitely turns off a lot of people. Some of this is because it's new technology. I mean, there's a, an old saying that says, you know, the last examples of an old technology will always work better than the first examples of a new technology. And we are still in those early days and early phases of this thing. There are still cars right now on dealer lots that are brand new that have Chatamo ports, even though there's nobody putting new Chatamo chargers in the ground, um, nor should there be, I think. But, you know, I think we've given up on yeah. that, in at least in the U.S. Um, so th there's a lot there. But I think the biggest problem with this is that we're letting engineers drive this conversation. You cannot expect a 65-year-old car buyer getting into their first EV who is not a Steve Hanley, you know, 
or, or one of these guys that tries to stay up to, you know, just like a standard dad, right? Standard old guy is not going to get into one of these things and figure out, okay, I'm going to download an app. I have to enter my credit card information. It's terrible. Why can't I pull up to a charging port, swipe my credit card and plug in my car just like I can at a gas station? There's a lot to get into here. There's a lot to unpack in terms of like trying to mine data and digital feudalism and the the actual understanding of what's going on. But at the end of the day, we just need to agree on a simpler language. Simply saying level one and two is at home and then, you know, DC fast charging is on the road is not really doing it. You know, J1772, CCS, CCS2, NACS, Tesla, none of that's really doing it. And this is what I really like, you know, not to get back to Chargeway, but this is what I really like about Chargeway is it makes all that simple. You just tell it what kind of car you've got, and it only gives you those charging ports. It only gives you those that are not only compatible with your vehicle, but that are online and available. So if the station goes offline, it drops off the map. So you're not going to route your, you know, plan your route to some charging station that's not going to be online when you get there. And this is not, it doesn't, I mean, it, it is complicated, but it's not complicated as a solution to think of. Like when we but say it, we're on a road trip, why can't I just see the ones that work for my car? But that's a still, great point. It still doesn't set up and link like accounts like charge point electrify. You still have to do that on your own. Yeah. You have to do that on your own, but so, if you so that, know a hundred percent, but if you've is, got plug and charge yeah, or plug and pay, which some of the Fords do have, which uh, some of these rental companies do have, you know, with their vehicle, that that's the other thing that, you know, Hertz should absolutely, if they have an account where, you know, you can plug into a flow or you can plug into electrify America and it bills back to the rental company that should be built into the car or at least built into the Hertz app so that you can just scan that. But there's so much that needs to be done here. It's really frustrating. Yeah. And I didn't ask, I don't know if it was Hertz. It probably was because they're leading on EV rentals. Oh yeah. Uh, I just don't understand how you can decide we're going to roll out tens or hundred plus thousand electric cars and not have a process to make sure that people renting them know where and how to charge them. I just don't understand how that could happen. I mean, because I they know, don't care. The employees don't care. I'm sure there but is it should, a corporate it's gotta process. It's got to be like a, yeah, there's got to be a mandatory corporate process from the top down that makes sure that happens. But it just is not. No. But I don't know if it was Hertz. I don't know if they came from an airport an hour and a half away or an hour or, or 20 minutes away. Yeah, I, we don't know. I didn't, I didn't have time to, to, to and he did, he clearly just wanted to charge his car. So yeah. I just, as quickly as possible, the problem is I sent him off downtown half an hour away you know, knowing, oh, there's, these are free chargers there. I give them two options. One is charge point. One is in front of a library. It's just standard. You just plug in. There's no account. And I forgot to tell him, oh, and you got to make sure you have a charge point account. <laughs> so I was like, oh man, I hope he gets yeah. there and, and fault figures it out, gets the app, calls the number, whatever the process is for starting it or goes to the library one. <laughs> and that's, there's no process, thankfully, yeah. but there's like well, one charger there. And it's like, well, yeah. Zeal lucky? has a really nice solution for this, but it, it requires that you're uh, using Zeal hardware. But it, this idea where the intelligence is all in the phone, we just scan the QR code, hit it with Apple Pay, and then plug in. Um, but even that's complicated because you have to yeah. find the right hardware. <laughs> There's still there, some of well, the, the thing that frustrates me partly with this too is I saw this was an obvious problem in 2018 when the Model 3 started coming out. I went to a charge point station with my BMW i3 uh, model, one of the first Model 3s I saw rolled up, maybe the first, I don't know, one of the first, rolled up to the charge point station, was like confused, looking around, looking at stuff, and you know, walked, then talked to him, and he didn't realize he had to set up an account to charge there. Yeah. And I had to help him set up his charge point account. And this was a young guy, looked like a young software engineer or something like that. Someone you would expect would know what's up. And... And it was like, wow, this is mass market now. We need to get better at explaining this stuff. And we have yeah. not. It's five years later and it's horrible. Plug-in no, charge. If stuff. anything, it's gotten worse. Yeah, I I don't know. It's really frustrating. But these kind of things, well, let's move to something more positive. <laughs> this is a quick, interesting thing. So Ramirez, I, 
Kuhudzai, one of our uh, writers, Ram. really figured out something interesting. Great, He does great content. Uh, from around the world, but especially uh, focuses on a lot of African stuff we don't I don't see anywhere else. So he he sort of crunched the numbers. He looked at really closely at like used car imports in a handful of African countries. It's highlighted Zimbabwe, and you know just how just sort of figured out. Look, they're importing a lot of the used uh, gas cars from the U.S. and and Europe, and like five at, at like four or five years old. And then they're cheap, you know, to buy, but obviously they're fueled by gas or yeah. diesel. And he was like, if electric cars like the BYD Seagull and the Wuling Bingo can come to these markets brand new for the same price as these used gas cars, that is a real opportunity. You could sell a ton of these cheap electric cars. They're much better, higher quality than the gas, old gas cars. They are much less to to fuel and maintain with you know with electricity and and maintain, and it could be really disruptive uh, avenue for these companies if they if they do this and if they can do this you know at the low prices that you can see in their home markets of course, but even if it's a little bit more, the potential for disrupting this horrible used gas car market in countries like Zimbabwe is enormous, and I think it's a really inspiring exciting story if. Uh, if companies like Wuling uh, and BYD, you know, jump on it. And I sort of feel like they're seeing that and, and are in going in that direction, but I don't know. That's my thoughts on it. It's just really, really big opportunity. Uh, I'm curious what your thoughts are. And I'm also curious, I think you could speak better to what that means if a lot of used gas cars are no longer being exported and sold overseas, what that means for the home markets where they come from. Yeah, because I think there's a there's a lot of gray market. There's a lot of business that happens in and around the transportation of vehicles that are a couple of years old from the U.S. to Africa, to the Middle East, to other countries. Um, you know, we saw some of that during the Arab Spring, where some dude's random plumbing company truck ended up being uh, you know used by insurgents, and his logo was all over CNN, which was hilarious, by the way. But you do see that. And I think that if you start throwing these super affordable vehicles at those markets, you're going to have a, a real radical shift in the, the global demand for used cars. I think it's going to upset a lot more than you think it would in terms of car prices and everything else, because it has been a way for American dealerships and American companies to remove vehicles that are functioning vehicles that are serviceable vehicles take them out of the market and artificially increase demand for used vehicles and increase prices for used vehicles so i, I think that there's going to be yeah, something so there but i don't tease know it out just to sort of, i mean yeah i we don't know the scale of it I, if you don't know it i, I certainly don't know it, oh no, no no it's 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 a hundred it's hundreds of thousands of vehicles a year that, so, that I mean, leave just, the country just sure. going step by step here, we are able to export used gas cars to these other markets, yep. which helps to to keep the price of used sale cars cars higher than otherwise. Like if if five hundred thousand used cars are going to the dump instead of to another market, they have much less value, which means the value of your of your car that you suppose that you bought new when you sell it use to get another new car is going to be much lower so your your depreciation is higher your resale value is lower right that affects enormously the the new car market obviously as well yeah and how, and how much but remember these aren't cars that are going to the dump these are cars that are going to go live on for four or five or ten more years somewhere yeah. else that's what i'm They're saying if, they, if there wasn't that market for them where would they go well, you might argue that they wouldn't go anywhere and the yeah. demand for new vehicles would plummet. That's I mean, this is what happened during the, the cash for clunkers thing where an entire generation of vehicles that, you know, were $2,000, $3,000 cars, but they were serviceable. They would get you from point A to point B. They were great cars for college kids or people just starting out. They were taken off the road 
buy this cash for clunkers because nobody else was going to give them five or seven grand for these cars. And it, it was, you know, depending on how you look at it, certainly the way that I look at it, it was a, uh, it was a shot at the middle class. It was a, a real big hit at the middle class and lower income Americans. And I think this kind of thing is the same way where, you know, you're, you're creating an artificial demand for newer and newer things, but at the same time, there's just a cultural shift, right? Where, it, you know, somebody looking at a car, I was, I was just having a conversation with someone the other day and they said, I don't want anything older than 2020. And it was like, okay, but based on what, like if it's got 20,000 miles on it, it's got all its service mm -hmm. records, but it's a 2017, why would you say no to that? And they're like, I don't know. It just sounds old. So like <laughs> some people are just clueless and there's nothing you can do. Well, I mean, there is an, there is a time factor as well as a mileage factor, but obviously the mileage factor is the bigger one, but yeah. Uh, well, there are two things on this. So one is in my opinion, this is where BYD can absolutely become the best selling BEV producer in the world because yeah. B BYD is making cars that could sell in these markets. It's starting to export more and more cars to more and more markets. Tesla has got a whole different growth strategy, it looks like, and it's not based on doing that. And if BYD can really do that and really ramp up and reach a lot more markets with high volume, it could 100% become the best-selling BEV producer in the world. Right now, it's number two, a bit far behind Tesla, but not like tremendously far and far ahead of anyone else. So I think that's one thought that comes to mind that the other thing is just what does that mean in far, as far as transport costs, import duties? Like this is where like this is where what, what is a five thousand dollar BYD Seagull cost? Or I don't know if that's how much I forget what the price is uh, in Zimbabwe or wherever. And, and like right. like how many markets can they efficiently reach? at a low enough cost to disrupt those markets. And, um, and is that their goal? Do they, would they rather just keep the raw materials in their own economy as the circular economy kind of thing, keep driving down the cost of their domestic products and keep ramping up their own profits. And that's also a question. And something Jose Pontes has argued is, uh, you know, a lot of people think the market will consolidate a lot around BEVs because because of disruption of the auto industry and his argument is he thinks there will be a lot more auto companies because it's simpler to produce bevs than you don't you don't need quite the the ip history and patents and all that stuff that you needed with engines to be i don't know if that's like, true I'm, i don't i it's an interesting take i don't know enough about it seems to be true but because you, I, theoretically, Zimbabwe can have its own car company that then produces cheaper EVs that no one else can compete with, right? Yeah, exactly right. And it, it does seem to be true. Um, you know, this is why you do have Tesla, you do have Lucid, you do have Rivian, you do have Fisker. We are seeing a proliferation of car companies and not only on the low end, but, you know, in, in, the, in the medium end. But on the extreme high end as well, you you know, Faraday is out there still somehow. You've it got... is. And the guy is not in jail. I was like, he was like, they were like chasing. He was in hiding a few years ago. Yeah. And I saw and, some and post got... recently. I was like, oh, he's like out there promoting his companies again. Yeah. And you've got wrong? VinFest and you've got Mate Remac, who is doing tremendous stuff. You've got electric motorcycle companies. You've got Damon. You've got Zero. You've got Energica, which is coming up later in the show you know, all of these companies are doing really great work and they're doing it with EVs and electrical because it is much less complex. Yeah, we've got a VinFest story. I wasn't sure if it was next, but it's not. So next we have Netherlands EV sales report. We, we've gotten used to these now, so I think we can just roll through the highlights. But Whoa. the highlights are 47% of new car sales in, in the Netherlands are plug-in cars now. 34% are full electrics. This is, one, this is my well this has been one like my, my fit one of my favorite countries since i was a kid it was my favorite soccer team uh when i was a young kid and uh i lived there for five months did a so i, I love this country but it's just they've got such a diversified market it's such a balanced diversified market you still have the model y far ahead but you have so such a balanced diversified market and the person the mass adoption is so high up to 47 percent or 34 percent of bevs um and yeah that's that's it i mean that's this is the the chart for 
we've talked about these before, so we don't need to go on about it. But any any comments you have on on this before we move to the next story? Um, really surprised the Ford Kuga is doing so well. Mm, yeah, it's been popular in Europe, but but yeah, this is this is the highest I've seen it as far as I remember. And um, where is the new. thing made? A good question. Yeah, I don't know. You know, the Kuga is a really interesting. It's, I mean, they had something similar here in the U.S., right? It was like it was called like the Eco Sport or some ridiculous thing. Um, let's see, I think that's exactly what it was called. And then you got the Lincoln Company uh, plug-in hybrid number three. Yeah. They a uh, lot of yeah subscribe services. I remember like a year ago, I was at, I was giving a presentation at a Florida Tesla conference, and um, I met someone, a reader who who had rented a, a Lincoln company in Barcelona and it was apparently like, um, it's a big, big, well, that's a good question. Are these separated out for fleet sales or individual sales or they're, well, they're all so, just individual sales? So much of the Dutch market and Europe in general, but especially the Dutch market is, is like f- technically fleet sales because yeah, like ride share. Companies buy them and then they're, they're business cars. It's a very common system there to you that people are driving business cars. It's just the tax, all the tax stuff sets it up where it's, it's, uh, that's how most people have. Yeah. So cars. I think just the, the key takeaway here is how prominent Geely is because Geely, because yes. if you look at number two is Geely, number three is Geely, you go back down a little ways, you know, that, that, that's, that's quite a bit. If you add those up, you would say that Geely is outperforming Tesla model Y. Yeah, um, two and three the, on the year and to number date. sixteen. Yeah, t- that was two and three on the year to date. I just moved to the September to see if. Ah, oh, I see, I see. But no, that I thought there were more Volvos at the top there, but apparently, yeah. apparently not right now. But yeah, that's that's the Dutch market. If you look at brands, um, Tesla's number one. Auto groups, Stellantis is number one. Stellantis. Volkswagen Group. Believe <laughs> Volvo is third among, and that's for plug-in vehicles. So. Yeah, a lot of people would rather see BEVs. I'd rather just. There's see some the- Stellantis news that's worth talking about. I know it's not on our list of approved topics, but before we move on to the next thing, uh, there were some spy photos that were captured of the upcoming Dodge Challenger, that electric thing that makes a noise. Uh, yes. And um, it's really weird how, if you look at the unibody, it does seem to be a hatchback body style, which is a little bit different than what you'd normally expect from a car like that. And it seems to be built around a central transmission tunnel. A lot of people are saying that this looks like it's going to be a internal combustion kind of thing solution. Uh, but obviously Volvo and Geely are making similar vehicles with that transmission tunnel and they're putting the battery in there. So it's interesting. It'll be interesting to see what Stellantis is really doing with that thing. Um, but since I can't think of any other vehicle that they sell in the U.S., I figured I'd throw that in there. Yeah, I have some jokes inappropriate for the show, so let's move on. Let's uh, <laughs> the 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 uh, this is really fun. I mean, look, yeah, concept cars irritate me, but I also love them. So if they're if they're like, there's a certain balance because I, I, they irritate me when I'm like, oh, I wish that was going to be real. It's not going to be real. Why do they make it so unrealistic? But then when but then you're just like, oh man, I really like. Yeah, that. but I said that about the EV9. And I said that about the Ionic 6 and the Ionic 5 and Hyundai Kia really seems to be pushing these things into production. So, so we have, I, I think we can get excited about it. It'll be safe. We, we have two fine. Kia stories. So just make, just to make sure you don't jump to the second one, which we'll get to next. But, um, this first one is about the EV3, EV4, and EV5 that Kia just introduced. You want to start with the EV5? Not really. Let's start with the EV3. <laughs> I love the EV3. The EV3 is cool, <laughs> man. The EV3? It's right there, right there. Yeah, this is my favorite. This that is, SUV. yeah, that is like right there in that Volvo EX30. That is like a, a you know, slight, a size smaller than the Model Y. This is exactly where, you know, a lot of people have been talking about Tesla doing a Model 2 vehicle. This is exactly where that thing needs to fall in terms of size and mileage. That is a mainstream little car. That is right where, you know, Hyundai with the original Elantra and the Accent uh, and the XL back in the, the way before time. That's where these car companies really made their mark in the U.S. by putting out a affordable little car that was reliable and dependable and fun to drive. And this just is more of the same. It's got some great details in there. 
just some fun it's little so, visual cues. It's so fun looking, but I would, what is this going on right here? You, can it's you just see? cool, man. It's just it like, looks really cool, but then I'm like, wait, what is it? And I thought Joe would know. <laughs> it doesn't look like anything, honestly. The, the the closest thing I can come to with that is that miniature, miniature windshield wipers. Oh, no, that's not windshield wipers. <laughs> I was kidding, going to say internal combustion vehicles, a lot of them would, would have the... Um, the vents at the back of the hood specifically like you know a, a lot of sportier ones would have vents at the back of the hood this just seems to be a visual sort of nod to that and you can tell this is a concept it doesn't have windshield wipers the mirrors are the wrong size it doesn't have the amber side indicators and things like that Stop the bumpers. Breaking my heart yeah i mean it's gonna change this is not what it's gonna look like but like also this is what it's gonna look like so like this kind of cool well so I, I the only thing I could think maybe aerodynamics it helps with I don't know how but you know it looks like some create some little wind tunnels for the wind to die, to spread out. Uh, wh wh and what about these little like uh, triangular things? Do you have any idea what that's about or no? I mean, it's a concept car, right? Okay. Yeah. All right. All right. Just, well, yeah. I'll just say if it looked anything like this, it would be in my top tier of vehicles I would consider for my next vehicle because I love it. And uh, yeah, it's a fun little car. Exterior is fun. I love it. I love its sort of sportiness on the back, just smaller. I, I like smaller cars, but the interior, I'm in love with this interior. I don't know. Yeah. I love the the material here on the doors and the dash. It, obviously, it's got a bit of like a retro look. Like it also sort of reminds me of like my grandparents or something. And that, but I, but it's, it's clean and nice and Your grandparents were happening dude this thing's awesome. enough <laughs> that i like and i just love the green color i am i'm not a fan of the yoke but i do like this kind of uh steering wheel design although i i think it it might not it might get worn out too much also it's not going to go to production as, as no that won't go to production i will say this that the the toyota bz4x that i'm driving right now it has a carpeted dash like this, which I thought was really neat. I've never really seen that before. And I was really excited to see it in the Toyota. I thought it was very different. And now I'm seeing it in this Hyundai. So I think that's a trend that's coming mm -hmm. online, which is really nice because it cuts down significantly on the reflections in the dashboard. It cuts down oh. significantly on heat. Like when you leave the car right. out in the sun, the leather doesn't, you know, the cloth doesn't get hot the way the leather does. Right. So it, it, it's really, really nice. Um, so I, I'm excited to see more of that in here. And again, this won't see production. Those door handles won't see production. Those mirrors won't see production. <laughs> yeah. There's no, you know, there's not even a, there's not even a button on this thing for the steering wheel stock. So they're just pretending that, you don't. Know, it never rains in Hyundai's concept land. Which oh yeah. Is great. Oh, uh, there's a lot here to, I mean, the, the, yeah, the rear view mirrors, the, the, the pedals are on pedals. like pistons. So they yeah. push them in. And the, oh. uh, the lack of the a divider between the passenger and I mean, there's a lot of a lot of what I love in it is not going to be in production. That's why um, I said I, I love them and I hate them because uh, you get all excited and then it doesn't. Yeah, work. like I really want that and I know I can't have it, so it's not really not really nice. So that's the EV3, very cool yeah. though. And I don't I don't really understand this. There's something like it's not clear. It's not clear if this is going to be produced. It's like well, of course. <laughs> It's, it's going to be there's going to be an ev3 like yeah. i don't understand the point of saying oh we don't know yet if we're going to produce it so like what do you mean why show a car if you don't know i mean it just i don't get it they but, show the car to see if people are going to demand it uh, to see if there's a how are they really it. measuring that nonsense like the, people yeah people don't know jack anyway <laughs> i mean the, people claim the, that there's going to be two million you know cyber trucks because they announced it and people had interest in it Five expected expected price range 30 to fifty thousand dollars so that's like you know uh model yeah. three model y territory then there's the ev4 sedan similarly cool uh similarly unrealistic. a lot of the same stuff <laughs> yes exactly i'd rather yeah it's a bit like long for my take like a little weird long like the cadillac lyric is uh yes but that's I'm, I'm yes. not a fan of that look i think it's weird it's like either make it big or make it shorter don't make it weird and long like i don't know but um yeah it's like the same and i mean not the same and very similar the mirrors are the same the pedals the wheel the yeah. door the doors are a bit different and the uh, the material 
but it's the same basic uh how you can see there too like, that that space where something can roll on under your foot from the passenger side yeah but it doesn't matter it. because it's on the it's on the piston right it's on a load sensing yeah. piston it's not Still, a pivot, there's some so. various things that could roll under there's know. there's i mean again it's a concept car it's an art piece it's not meant to be a real car just yeah. let it go i can't let it go joe i wanted it it's so um, weird looking okay yeah I, I much prefer the ev3 and then there's the ev5 which is the more they are one the ev5 is definitely going to come to production i mean if you yeah. look at it it's got it's a much more finished piece yeah it's got a much better sense of you know the the side mirrors you've got yep. the side indicators there there's a couple things that are going to be different as it makes its way to production. You're going to have more pronounced bumpers. You're going to have those amber side indicators. You're going to have a couple of different things, but that's real close, I think, to what yeah. we're going to get. Yeah, and they don't have any super cool interior views of an unrealistic interior. So, yep, that's it. Moving so it's on. It's going to be cool though. It's 160 kilowatt motor, 530 kilometer range on the China. Of course, we're getting China figures here, so it makes me think. The first market that's going to get it is Korea, which we've talked about before. So we've got the EV9 pricing and specs came out for that just the other day. Yeah, great vehicle. Uh, do you have any? I mean, I don't have any comments on this. I mean, this is this is not an, a vehicle that interests me. You, you, this is more your your market. Yeah, yeah. So I'll say this. You know, I, I've I've been a big fan of what Kia and Hyundai have been doing for a number of years here. Um, I would hesitate to say that uh, I'm a player on this, but I think I think there's going to be a lot of people who are not going to wait for the Volvo EX90 to come out, and they'll swing on this. I think there's a lot of people who maybe they were interested in the uh, Model X, but it was a little too unconventional for them. This is, I mean, this is just straight up a three row SUV electric. Yeah. I think a lot of people are going to swing on this. I, I don't know if this is right or not, but I can't think maybe the Mercedes EQB is, is, a, is a three row SUV. What I, other three row yeah. SUVs are out there? There's not many that are pure electric. Well, I got to admit that when those come in, they go in one in my head and go right back out. I don't really think about it much. Uh, it's not my, like I said, not really my market, but it's not where you're shopping. Yeah. Yeah. But uh, yeah, we'll come down to the, the picks, which are interesting, but a couple of highlights here on what's in it. So they've got this onboard power generator, so you can do vehicle to load, vehicle to home capability, vehicle to grid capability. So this is you know something a lot of people want. On the, uh, it's got an 800 volt uh, platform, eGMP platform, yep. which allows up to 350 kilowatt of power. So this car could use Ernie, oh no, wait, could use uh, Regina at that EV go station in Dallas. That doesn't sound right. Yeah. <laughs> this is, there's so much wrong there. But... There's, there's a lot. I was going to say, <laughs> plug into Gina. No. Yeah. <laughs> Don't do that. Like I, I, I just thought about it when we were talking about it. I was like, why did they name? The oh, this, this is thing? the worst. So I, this I used to date good. this girl. I used to date this girl, Gina, and I loved her. She was amazing. Um, and my buddies for like a year, they would call her Va and I didn't get it. And then I finally got it and I could never uh, face her again. <laughs> oh <my. laughs> well, the, Oh, so this one is the price range fifty, <laughs> yeah, fifty-five thousand to seventy-four thousand. So yeah. again, this is like, um, well, you know, it's it's a large vehicle. So, so there's that. This this interior picture is this the the real version or this is a an earlier concept? That's an earlier concept because it's got those pedals and steering wheel. Like we, um, very cool looking. Yeah, it looks great. But it's not anything like that. The production one, I don't. I mean, the production one has a, a round steering wheel. It's got a center console. Okay. All right. It's not uh, that it's nothing like that. Uh, I should have. I should. Yeah. Okay. Let's move yeah, on to BMW. It's not that it's nothing like that, but it's not that. BMW. It's a, lot, it's a lot more conventional than that. Also has some some big news. It's uh, gosh, those grills sheer driving pleasure I firsts i, I can't yeah. what i don't know what to do with that can't get behind those grills yeah the i think the uh 
the claim to best driving experience. What was it called? What's the BMW phrase for that? Um, the, the ultimate, ultimate driving. driving machine. Yeah. yeah, I feel like I have nothing to add for this. Okay, we'll move on. BMW, goodbye. <laughs> if you, if you ever feel useless, remember that there's somebody whose job it is to put turn signals on a BMW. <laughs> Hi, my name is Scott Cooney. I started Clean Technica to promote clean energy and other sustainable alternatives, and for 13 years, we've been moving markets. If we had a nickel for every time someone told us they bought their first EV, solar, e-bike, or fill-in-the-blank clean energy solution, we'd be a cable TV channel by now. But we don't get those nickels. So unfortunately, we could use your help to reach a few more people. If just 1% of our audience chipped in a few bucks a month, we could hire dozens of great journalists and promote all sorts of climate solutions. It's easy, just go to cleantechnica.com support and sign up with a credit card in seconds. Cancel any time. But we'll be sending out some cool perks too, so I think you'll want to stick around. With your support, we'll keep leading the charge. Thank you so much. Well, the, oh, so the one thing here that's worth highlighting, in the third quarter, BMW brand sales in the U.S. Uh, oh, sorry. No. That's yeah, right. we, we thought that was relevant. It's no, I not. was like, wait, that's not the percentage I'm looking for. Uh, so in the third quarter, 15.6% of BMW brand sales in the U.S. for battery electrics. So that's... Oh, wow. That's double the... Around double the national percentage. That's that's good. I mean, that's for the really U.S. Good. market... And yeah. you got to imagine that a lot of those were BMW buyers who had defected to Tesla or thought about defecting to Tesla and who are now coming In back into the fold. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, it's, I mean, it's showing good progress. I see the iX um, SUV around here a bit. I don't really notice the i4. I don't know. I still again, want there's to nothing to notice. They BMW. look just like the regular cars. You wouldn't know it unless you're oh, behind well, you it. Can, you can, t yeah, but it's not, yeah, I don't, I not don't, obvious. I'm not, I'm not, I used, it used to be my favorite brand when I was in high school, college, it was my favorite brand. I don't, I don't, uh, I'm not happy with, it. I had a BMW, the i3. I love that still, but I'm not a fan of what they're doing. Anyway, yeah. let's go. So this is just, um, I think it's interesting. There's, you know, the EU commission, European union is always debating, you know, how aggressive to make different fuel economy standards and, and requirements. And uh, the interesting thing there is that with the climate there, that a big consortium of companies are pushing the climate con commissioner to be aggressive and put a hundred percent electric corporate fleet requirement by 2030. And that includes Volvo cars, Ford, Renault group, Ikea, um, Tesco, Tesco is like sort Supermarket of like market chain. Yeah. Like sort of like the Walmart of, I mean, it's, it's a huge supermarket that's like, it's it's so big. I don't think there's anything really bigger except for like an Ikea in some of these markets. But yeah, so there's, I, I just think that's really cool to see that there's that push from mainstream automakers. I mean, Volvo, of course, is ahead of the curve, as Joe will always tell us. But even Renault and, and Ford. Yeah, well, and Renault has been pushing like EVs Ikea. since day one. They've been one of the early, early adopters. Yeah, well, it's complicated with right now. <laughs> but that's just it's complicated. Good we have a lot of stories, so we'll move on. Next one. Zero. You can talk about this, right? Yeah, I mean, I don't know what what is there is to say much on this. So Zero Motorcycles, they were kind of the most famous uh, of the uh, you know electric two-wheelers. They're dropping their prices in an attempt to kind of boost demand. But I think what they're finding is that motorcycles, at least in the U.S., are not yet a, uh, they're not really seen as practical A to B kind of things. Um, you know, they're, they're lifestyle purchases, right? They're lifestyle vehicles. And there's a lot of brand legacy that you have to overcome. Whenever you talk about American motorcycles, 50% of the market is still Harley Davidson. And I think something like 75% of all the bikes sold are still heavy cruiser type bikes. And those are, that is a type of bike that zero does not make. So they're already fighting an uphill battle. And I, I'm not really sure who the customer was. I think 
the people who are behind zero are big fans of like the Ducati scrambler and the monster and things like that. Um, but yeah, those th that's not a mass market in the U S so they're going to have to cut prices to boost demand. I think the, the partnership that they have with Polaris to develop some uh, high powered ATVs and side-by-side -side utility vehicles. I think that's going to be much more lucrative for them. Um, yeah. As a, as a motorcycle guy, I've just never really been enamored by the zeros. I know they're good quality. I know people who have them and love them, but they don't support really high speed charging. They don't have big batteries. And when you're limited, even if you're limited to 90 or hundred miles of range, which is plenty for a commute, but you know, you live in an apartment, you don't have a place to plug it in. The, the, the ownership experience kind of sucks. So I I'm, yeah, I just don't see it. I have more I'm, electric motors. I cycles are not really my thing but i i think yeah it's well that one's definitely not electric just yeah to be clear. So, so this is a story from australia about the benzina zero and different uh a few people who have gone from a ducati a honda and a rome to a benzina zero electric a benzina zero duo electric uh motorcycles so it's just interesting different takes on the transition going to the duo plus um yeah, yeah. Uh, it's, it's just, uh, again, the market sort of expanding, evolving, and, you know, people finding it, but it's not my market. So, yeah, that's... It. it just, you know, and I've said this before, I think I think I would have an all-electric home, an all-electric car, maybe even an electric boat before I had an electric motorcycle. It just, it just doesn't, uh, doesn't excite me. But you do get excited by racing. You're a big auto. Ah, racing. I'm glad this came up. So this is actually really interesting. So Energica is putting their electric bikes. Uh, the Energica obviously was the uh, MotoGP3 uh, supplier for a while where they were doing the electric bikes for the feeder series into MotoGP. And they have come over to the United States now that they're owned by uh, Ideanomics, which is more or less an American company. They have been racing and competing against internal combustion vehicles, and they took their first podium ever. It's not a special class. It's not like, you know, that there's some kind of uh, funny business going on. This was a straight race, and they put it on the podium at Circuit of the Americas. And this is a really great example of the torque advantage that EVs have. If you look at that long uphill climb that these guys are on, the elevation changes at Road America and the ability to use that uh that energy recovery braking in conjunction with the mechanical piston braking to really have a stable confident platform going into these corners this was something that was a long time coming and the fact that they did it here i think is great they're gonna you know there's a couple of uh race tracks that are kind of drag strips where the evs are going to shine but this was uh this is certainly not one of them other than the elevation changes so this is always good to see and as the you know electric batteries get better and the uh, not only better but lighter, you're going to start to see this more and more. You're going to see the podiums are just going to be electrified simply because of the nature of electric or of motorcycle racing being shorter distance overall, more dependent on torque and uh, linear power delivery. This is similar to like when Honda and Yamaha were doing the big bang four cylinders in uh, superbikes in the late 90s, early 2000s, back in the Carl Fogarty days, they were building them so that the four cylinders would spark at the same time and create a much more linear progression and not cook the rear tires under you know torque load. So you're seeing that again with these uh, electric motorcycles having a clear advantage in terms of torque delivery. And they're gonna, that as they develop their technology, battery technology, they're just gonna get better and better. Yeah, this is in Austin, right? This is the track we were at. This is Circuit of the Americas. This is where you and I were in yeah. uh, November. Yeah, you can see I'm not a, <laughs> I'm not a racing guy. Is that a tie can down there? I don't know, but uh, yeah, this this is um, just cool news to see that progressing. I was going to mention in in the zero story. So Scott Cooney, our our founder, main main uh, owner of Clean Technica, he's got our a corporate master. Yeah, he's got a zero electric bike well he had a zero bike. now he has the energica well i i thought he was about to switch but i wasn't sure if he'd made the switch yet but yeah i i know he was he was looking at a couple bikes recently in california 
trying to determine which to switch to, but I think he was most likely going to switch to the Energica. Yeah. Yeah. Why? Well, I, I, I believe he did. Yeah. I mean, he oh, identifies yeah. himself. Right yeah. I'm currently yeah. writing the Energica SCSE 9. So yeah, he yeah. test drove that he he's he's gone on some co- corporate trips to like um he went to Italy, yeah. he went for the debut of that bike. And that was a, that York. was a hot trip, yeah. That was a hot trip. That, that, that's it's a great bike. I mean, if you look at it on paper, the 0 to 60 time is there, the acceleration is there, they have decent range. It's just yeah. I don't know. It's you a, know, it's clearly like a more, you know, sporty James Bond looking bike than uh than the zero. yes yeah exactly exactly i mean you know i i'm i'm a different kind of rider i'd be yeah if i was gonna go and do something bonkers like this i you know drive a vespa in downtown chicago if i wanted like to totally. really that's cheat me. death that's me <laughs> yeah absolutely as it should be as it should be you want to cheat death go drive a, a vespa in downtown traffic or just try walking around tampa florida uh, or just so, try walking around Tampa, Florida. So this is sure. a Tampa, Tampa, Florida story. Tampa nearby. Um, they, I thought they got a lot of these from the picture. I was like, oh wow, they got a lot of te- yellow yeah, Tesla Model Y ride sharing vehicles now in Tampa. But they have six. But yeah, still six. Oh, there of these. you go. Six you can, is plenty. Yeah, it's more than can, I have. You can go to downtown Tampa or or different neighborhoods in Tampa now and uh, get a ride for two dollars per person up to four passengers in a yellow Tesla Model Y. I just love that they're yellow, you know, like, I don't know, yeah, this iconic like taxi, taxi color. People have it's tried It's highly all visible. People are going to see it. They're going to go, oh, cool. And it's going to make Tampa seem more high tech than it is when you see this. Oh, Tampa is a very yellow. tech, very big tech center now for software. It's a big, uh, it's been a growing hub for software engineering tech. tech sure. Level. Yeah, and this is going to be this is going to be good for that. So I think it's I think it's a good thing. I mean, it's not Chicago, but not uh, Chicago. What's happening in Chicago actually? But it's I not know. Orlando, or Miami, but, uh, or Jacksonville. <laughs> I showed this to my daughters. They're like, "But why are so many people cutting it? Like, why does they need so many people to cut it?" I was like, <laughs> it's quite- "Yeah, there's six Teslas and 15 people Explain. trying to take credit for it. That's Florida Explain politics. It's kind of ceremonious, but uh, yeah, it's." I just think it's exciting. I I mean, there's been ride sharing elsewhere. I the yeah the the yellow color is iconic from for for not just well for taxis for New York for for foreigners. I I found it interesting. I didn't really realize how much foreigners are like. I want to see the yellow cabs. I'm like <laughs> like oh, oh interesting because okay. it's something that's in movies and you know about it and it's like and the yellow school bus. It's like ah, it's a yellow school bus. You know, it's like yeah that's a school bus but it's just like this is a big deal because of our movie industry and our you know tv yeah. industry that this but that's kind of fair if i went to but, london no, again, I agree. I, yeah if i went to london again i want to get into a black cab i don't want some yellow yeah, mercedes or a, nonsense or a red double-decker bus right? exactly yeah take your blue double-decker bus and shove it <laughs> yeah no so i think it's it's cool I, i'm happy they made it yellow uh, this is, I don't know if we want to talk about Nissan. I, I put this in here as an mm. option. So they're basically, you know, they're going to, the, the 2024 LEAF is going to be, have battery components that make it eligible for the full tax credit instead of 3750 the $7,500 uh, max tax credit for buying one of these, plus make it available for the point of sale rebate starting in January. Mm-hmm. So, I mean, it's good news. Nissan, it's just it's just sad. Anytime Nissan comes up, you're like, you used to be a leader, and now you're a lag, and now you're just like slow to the po- get late to the yeah. Party. But we're we're wasting so much ink and energy on the Leaf when the Araya is actually a slick little ride. That's true, and I've seen, uh, yeah, the it's it's an interesting, uh, yeah, the Leaf. I don't know, like what? Maybe they just like remove it. I don't know. I don't know. I don't want to talk about Nissan. Let's just if you want to talk about Nissan. You want to talk about Nissan? No. no. Next. BMW and Nissan got the shaft. So I I am not that well. So Tesla has released eight wrap options that that you know te, like Tesla will wrap wrap it in theory Tesla. Yeah. Um, it's only actually available in a couple of loca- locations in California, West Covina and Carlsbad. So I think a lot of people assume this is available in general when you get a Tesla. You have to go to the yeah. Tesla shop. And you have to be get it and done in one of these places. So it's interesting. There's eight options. They're not my favorite for like wraps. Like I, 
I've we've featured that blue matte wrap that I love. I like like a really I don't know, but they're all right. Part of the story here, why I included it is they're like eight thousand dollars, seven thousand five hundred to eight thousand dollars, and yeah. which is a lot. But they're also more environmentally friendly than a typical wrap, which I found dubious, inspiring. Well, I don't know, <laughs> inspiring. Okay. I I was happy that they're not just doing wraps that they're doing special. They're doing, more, but I, I don't even know the details of it to know if I hundred percent know if that's true. But that's what they claim. So yeah. I I I have to tell you this story. There there's a um, there's another publication out there called Tesla Roddy that is a great resource for Tesla because they're like real obsessives and they they just like deep dive into every bit of minutia about Tesla. You know, like is this new door handle going to save production costs by thirteen cents? We do a sixteen page report to find out. They're like really into it. And they posted a picture of one of these with a wrap on it. It wasn't anything crazy. It was just a regular wrap. And the headline was huge. So, and it was like, you know, this shows that anything is possible with a, with Tesla. And that was like the most ridiculous, overhyped, <laughs> nonsensical headline. I just, I had to unfollow it because it was, just, it just had gotten too stupid. <laughs> I yeah, like, I, mean, I can I, wrap a car. The possibilities are limitless. Like, come on, dude. <laughs> if you go to one of these service centers and you're gonna pay more than you would get a normal wrap, uh, yeah, it's service, and you choose one of these like okay wraps, but it's not They're what fine. I would. Fine, yeah. But I mean, I would like get a mint green or like this really blue, like. Well, but that's the question, right? Like, why would you just order the car in champagne or like? whatever else whatever beige whatever version of beige you want to call that yeah this is satin rose gold are there really people like clamoring for a beige tesla (laughs) well the funny thing is some of these colors are very similar to original tesla color like they had a color sort of like this a while back this is a little bit like the silver that you could get with the model three and then this green they used to have a darker green that i loved Uh, I mean, they're days. nice colors, but they but just it's don't nothing seem... like. Yeah, they're nothing like. I feel like if you're gonna get a wrap, like they're normally bold, like there's something yeah, really like orange strong. or blue or because like yeah, you really want to feel it, like you know, you gotta feel like you really want that. I don't know. Anyway, that's it for Tesla. We'll just go about that one. Next, this is just a headline story because I think it's great news. So we should share. Clean cars yield 178 billion dollars in benefits for Illinois. Oh, it's your state, Yay. even. Look at that. I mean, uh, I'm in it. According to, uh, <laughs> oh, I thought you owned it. Oh, yeah, it's my, I'm, I'm in it. Wrong. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> yeah, so just good news. Uh, big, you know, economic impact study on EVs. And then paired with that, we have this this story from uh, Jennifer. If you're looking for a new career, EV charging technicians are in high demand. This is maybe something to discuss more because it, I've done. I think this is it. something we should almost do a whole show on. Because I've done a whole podcast show on this with uh, someone from a some people from ABB. Yeah, but I I think it's legitimate. I think it's a definitely a legitimate field because there there is so much there there is so much demand for it and that demand is only going up and you know it's just like we talked about with tesla reducing its prices where it's reducing its margins and increasing its warranty liability the more chargers that go in the ground the more need there's going to be for maintenance and repair yeah it's enormous I mean, there's a lot to say about this. I'll let you talk about it more. We will refer people. I mean, that's that's it. But like, clean, you know, okay, well, the, you can. I'm going to put the Clean Tech Talk podcast in the uh, yeah description where you can listen more on this. But one one thing I would just highlight that I said and and they seem to agree with, and others have agreed with. And frankly, this goes back to Elon was giving signs of this, and I, I had many DMs with Elon, Elon uh, back when he followed us on Twitter and tweeted our stories like three times a week or five times three to five times a week i had a number of yeah, not too many but you know quite a number over the years of DM, more, more than other people have yeah dm conversations with elon and one thing i gathered from those was that the number one bottleneck and concern for tesla for elon was 
the worker work workforce like uh you know yeah. having the right people and the right number of and the, the necessary number of people and this went from like the highest level of like ai engineers like competing with others over for those best engineers like you could see concerns in different ways he had with that to and you know getting quite combative with some competitors because of that fight for the best engineers to you know just needing workers and like they like basically said you know they they basically made a mistake with gigafactory nevada that they assumed people would work there and, and would go there and move there and they won't and so that's why you know when there was that debate about tulsa versus austin you know i had a bit of insight before it was announced that tulsa just wasn't going to cut it because people didn't want to move there and yeah. austin was going to be the place because people want to move there people want to move there and you need a lot of people to build cars to build factories and also to do this kind of work so yeah just what's what's highlighted for me from that and from a lot of others is that the biggest bottleneck in in clean tech growth but especially ev growth is the human resource bottleneck of getting electricians to install chargers to maintain chargers and this is a big deal so yeah frankly it's a huge growth market for anyone as jennifer says looking for a new career like, you know, we talked about that a little bit with uh, Q Merritt CEO, Tracy Price, when we had him on the show. And he gets into this all the time that vetting these contractors is increasingly difficult um, and keeping them that'll give you a high rating, you know, the high customer satisfaction rating is also huge. Elon makes an interesting point that people won't move there, but I'm going to make another point is not the right word for this. Um, I, I think that a lot more people would move for a job if they could move for a job it costs money to uproot yourself and go somewhere else i've had this conversation with plenty of these you know ultra conservative idiots all the time online they're like well if you don't like it why don't you leave it's like dude that's not how any of this works like it takes money to move like you can't even move out of your state most people without having a couple of months of uh you know savings and finances in the bank in addition to your moving costs, in addition to, you know, floating two residences at the same time for one to three to six months while you're trying to sell one and buy another one, like it's incredibly expensive to uproot your family and, and move somewhere else. And especially for a non-union job that doesn't have any kind of provisions for helping people move. I think this idea that people are just going to, I want to say, go on like a religious pilgrimage to work at Tesla. I think maybe that was true at one point, but I think as they become less and less of a startup and more of a legacy company, that's kind of everywhere, they're going to have to start doing relocation packages and offering well, something that people can't get elsewhere. Yeah. I think it's twofold. I mean, I definitely think for, well, I think, I think his, I didn't, I don't have detail, but I assume that his big, bigger issue with that was that the, the higher, level workers the, yeah. the ai engineers these people that they were not willing to move to tulsa but they were willing to move to austin it turns out later on months later they decided to keep their ai hub in silicon valley <laughs> so they, they won the fight in essence like they didn't want to move from silicon valley it sounds like um right. and austin seemed like okay austin's fine but then after all it's like nah we'd really rather be back in california not texas um, but the others, but thing, I mean, doesn't that make sense? Like, but even I, assume, if you're... I, I'm quite sure knowing what I know from Tesla, they were probably offered quite good packages to move and quite good, you know, arrangements for that. So I think that's one issue and it's just really like, we're not willing to live in Tulsa. Yeah. yeah we'll live in Austin. And I think the other issue is from the Nevada case where they thought, well, people will, will get enough people here because it's a you know big opportunity and i think it's kind of like okay there's this workforce in tulsa but if we expand beyond that how do we get people to do these lower wage jobs and to move to tulsa and i think that's just really hard so um yeah i think there's a lot to unpack there i i think that there's comp packages there's relocation benefits but there's also the fact that you're asking people to move from a state where they have bodily autonomy yep. to a state where you don't. I mean, 100%. you got to remember, Texas was talking about putting doctors in prison who were doing gender surgery. They're talking about 
going across state lines that if women leave the state pregnant and come back not pregnant, we're going to prosecute them as murderers. I mean, I'm pretty sure I saw a story sort of recently where a lady did go to prison for this for yeah, I, uh, going I'm out of sure state. She did for an abortion. Back. Yeah. And either I mean, um, their, t- yeah. their sister is the one I, I don't know but any in any case like it's happening <laughs> so it's I happening yeah people are very nervous to live in texas and for good reason and um and i mean really there's a lot of benefits beyond that in california that people a lot of people don't want to acknowledge but i mean it's best climate like i mean aside from the fire risk but you have other risks in texas too including fires but um well you get but, fires you get hurricanes you get ice storms I mean, we get we have broken the climate so we're going to have climate disasters pretty much everywhere you just have but, to decide which ones you're comfortable with but the general regular climate and environment in california is superb the the public uh, resources are amazing the the atmosphere the culture so uh, anyway but yeah the broader issue if you're looking for a new career or even you're just um considering it like very loosely I think you should have no problem becoming an EV charging technician and having good work wherever you go. How do you find those jobs? How, what job board do you go on? I don't even know. Yeah. Well, future show. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. Uh, so I don't, I don't know much about this one yet, but it's been big news. The there's a, a Japanese oil company that is supposedly helping Toyota to produce, you know, eventually produce solid state batteries. Toyota has been talking about solid state batteries for a few millennia. Um, <laughs> it's it's forever the Toyota promise why you don't need to buy an EV today because we're going to have solid state battery EVs. I don't know. What do you? What are your thoughts on this? On this news? I mean, and I have the link you gave me, so we we can go to that whenever. Yeah. So you know, it's funny because they they talk about. Uh, the writer, I think it was Tina Casey, talks about why would an oil company get involved in this? And the oil companies have been in, not only in the battery technology space for a long time, but really from the very beginning, the uh, the batteries that we were working with uh, at US Electric Car back in the 90s, a lot of those were coming out of the Chevron research labs and had Chevron patents on them. And the the battery technology that was coming out of Chevron in the 90s was really second to none. And depending on who you believe in terms of like, you know, what version of the tin hat conspiracy you subscribe to, these guys are still very much leading the way technology wise. And they simply just haven't released a lot of these patents or released the technology into the wild. And it does make sense a little bit to have a protectionist patent, to just go out, get ahead of the technology, patent it, and then prevent anybody from using it until it becomes, uh, you know, worth your while to do so. So there is that kind of version of of this conspiracy thing. But the other one is just, look, Chevron is in the mobility business. They're in the energy business. You know, they are primarily getting energy from gas and oil, but they are an energy company. And batteries are a great place to store energy, regardless of, you know, uh, kind of how it's generated. So it does make sense for them to be in this space and in this tech. And uh, they certainly are. So I don't see that being any different to this Japanese oil company getting involved. I think it makes sense for them to be in bed with Toyota. It makes sense for them to, you know, kind of to be leading the charge, not to use the pun. Mm -hmm. So in, in that sense, it makes sense. And they also have the infrastructure to mine, to refine, to transport raw material and, and unrefined materials. They know how to do all that stuff. So th- this is just a different commodity that they're doing it with. Yeah, we'll see. I mean, the time frame is still 2027 to 2028. Five. Oh, no, solid state batteries are two years away. It's uh, forever, forever five years away. That's it. Yeah, so that's that. I don't, is this to talk uh, about? You gave me this link and it, hang on, other hang people on, have shared on. this link. People can't help but sharing this link. Are we talking about this? <laughs> I or, mean, we talked about it. That's it. What okay. What else are you going to say? We know what that is. Toyota 900 knows miles. What that is. 900 mile EVs. Do you think, <laughs> I, what Nick I love still, about this. Shalop Nick is still just classic. Uh, I know. What, their, what I love about this 
so much is that Toyota is waging a campaign to prevent people from buying someone else's EV. That's yep. all this is. This is not about any technology that Toyota actually has. This is not about a vehicle that Toyota is actually going to produce in the next couple of years. This is simply to create FUD, to create doubt and prevent people from buying a car that is not a Toyota. That's all this is. This is for the guy who's got a Toyota Highlander that's a 2015, who's looking to trade out of it. And he goes, oh, well, you know, I'd like to try an electric car, but Toyota doesn't have one. This is to get that guy to go, give us one more year, give us two more years. That's yeah. all this is. This, well, And I hate to be cynical, but no, there, there's yeah. nothing genuine about this. Well, we've been saying that for years about Toyota and, and others, but Toyota has been the most egregious Lexus with their self-charging EVs, <laughs> their Stop. hybrids. Uh, yeah. And I've, so I've, oh man, I've, I, I know a Tesla Model 3 owner who's, you know, older guy, not, not a tech guy. And he's like, you know, he had a bad experience. He didn't realize when you drive on an interstate, you're going to lose range faster. And he had to supercharge and he wasn't happy about it. He was like, you know what they should do? They should have like a self charging battery that has a, a system in it that charges the battery. And it's like, yeah, that exists. That's been tried. <laughs> That's not the future. <laughs> but anyway, I didn't talk about it with him. But, uh, two things with this one is toyota knows its market knows its customers and it's clinging to them it's like clinging to those toyota owners who are like ev curious and they're like Would no no, no don't leave us clenching up on the uh they're, toyota they're, marketing yeah they're yeah exactly they're they're you know they know they don't offer much for these people so it's like you just don't go yet don't leave us yeah, you know it. we need you and then secondly, I used to hear that kind of statement and I think it's getting dissolved and it's getting sort of getting, it's losing. Like I had, you know, someone in my extended family, actually a couple, but a couple of people, but one of them, I distinctly remember him saying, you know, like he was going to wait for, you know, the big guys to create EVs. He wasn't ready to get an EV yet. And then all of a sudden got an, a Volkswagen ID4 earlier this year. And it's like, for me, it was like, you know, nothing much had changed in the past few years. Like there were options. I mean, he could have got similar options before, but all of a sudden it felt like the time. And I think Toyota is like sort of they're taking too long and they're they're. I mean, they have the that weird named EV that you had. Do you still have that in your driveway? I do. BZ I was actually Ford. thinking of doing a walk around video on it and just yeah. just but. I don't feel like I can be objective about the car without ripping it to shreds because I, I just I just don't like it. Yeah. Well that's yeah, that's Toyota. I, I, I'm I'm typically not a conspiracy theorist, not too cynical. And I just think that's what they're doing. They're delaying EV's sales, trying to hold on to their yeah, their, their group. This is, uh, again, just a highlight. Vin Group investing in a second battery factor factory and Vin Group the Vin Group just sort of uh, donated its energy storage division to VinFast, <laughs> which you can do when you're a state-owned corporation. Right, right, right. exactly. Ninety-nine point eight percent of of uh, the chairman's shares um, got donated, and that's nice. <laughs> that's okay. Well, you know, VinFast basically. Um, yeah, I mean, look, this is a for real company that's building for real cars. They may have quality issues, but uh, yeah, I, I you can't bet against these guys. They're too huge. I mean, you want to talk about too big to fail. When these guys need money, they literally print more. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I think, yeah, VinFast is in a different boat. It's an interesting company to follow. Very intriguing. Well, that's the story. That's the show. Joe, do we have any final comments? That was know. a lot. That was a lot. That felt like a long one. Yeah, but that's what happens when you don't do these for four days. There's 64 yeah. stories to talk about. <laughs> yeah, we tried to keep it. I tried to avoid some, but. Um, <laughs> right. Yeah. All right. Peace out, guys. Peace. Thank you. Cheers. Have a good day.